Hey friends, it's Rachel. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another monthly reading wrap-up where I share with you the books I read this month. This is the last reading wrap-up for the entire year and it's crazy to think about and I have eight books to go through so I don't know how long this video is going to be. I know people probably like shorter videos but if there are things to be said about a book I'm going to say them. So sit back, get comfy, get a warm drink and a blanket and settle in because we're going to be talking about eight books in this video. Without further ado, let's begin with the first book and that is Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz. This is a book that I decided to read because I had recently seen the TV adaptation of it and so I picked up the book version and I gave it a try. I very much liked the TV adaptation but the book was a bit less so for me and I have a video in which I talk about the differences between the two adaptations but I don't encourage watching that if you want to avoid spoilers because if you think you might be even the least bit interested in watching the TV show then I would avoid that video because there are lots of spoilers. But this book is basically a story within a story. It's a murder mystery and one of the timelines is set in modern times in which the main character Susan Ryland who is an editor gets the latest manuscript for Alan Conway's newest book. He is the author of the very popular fictional series about Atticus Punt who is a Detective and that series is set in 1950, but as Susan reads through the manuscript to edit it, she realizes that the last chapter is missing and it's very unsatisfying. You can't have a whodunit without finding out who did it. And to make matters more complicated, Susan soon receives word that Alan is dead by an apparent suicide. However, the more she looks into it, the less likely she believes that Alan took his own life and that someone murdered him and that the disappearance of the last chapter is somehow to do with his murder and if she can find the last chapter she might be able to find who murdered Alan as well as solve the mystery within his book. And then of course the second timeline that we get is the actual book that Alan Conway wrote itself. We get to read it as he wrote it. This is a little bit differently done in the TV show and I much preferred it, but I thought overall the concept as it was portrayed in the TV show was very twisty and flat out genius, but I thought that it was a bit less so in the book. Obviously the main elements are all still there, they're just executed in a different way that I found ultimately less satisfying than what is done in the TV show, but I do kind of believe that whatever medium you first consume a story in is probably the one that you're going to like the most. And I am not a believer that the book is always better, but in this case I think that the TV show was better than the book. But since we're talking about the book, all I would really have to say is I recommend the TV show first. Next we have The Lindbergh and Annie by Mariah Fredericks, and I have a video about this book as well in which I discuss how this book differed from the historical facts and reality surrounding the topic that this book is based on. This is a historical fiction novel that follows Betty Gao, who was the titular Lindbergh nanny, and this is Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator that we're talking about. If you didn't already know, his son was kidnapped and later found murdered. Unfortunately, it was a huge case and it led to the making of a federal law that made transporting a kidnapping victim across state lines a federal crime. So this was a huge big deal when it happened. It was in the early 1930s and it was dubbed the crime of the century. So this story follows Betty as she is employed by the Lindberghs, as she takes care of Charlie, and then of course how the family reacts in the immediate aftermath after Charlie is kidnapped. And I thought that this book would focus more on the crime itself because obviously that is ultimately what the story is about because there is no story without the Lindbergh kidnapping, but instead it focuses more on the people that are involved and the human aspect of things, which is in no way bad. But if you were like me at the beginning of this and you went into this book hoping to learn more about the actual crime itself, there's not a lot of detail and so that's why I was inspired to make the video on this book that I did in which I discussed the actual historical facts surrounding the crime, but all in all it did stay very truthful to the historical events as we know them. Obviously when you're writing historical fiction you can't know every single thing that happened, you can't know every single thing that someone said to someone else, and so you have to take some creative license and invent something. So I was pleasantly surprised overall how accurate the book was and I did learn a few things along the way looking into this case and getting involved with it. One complaint I did have was with the writing style. There were paragraphs that were very short and there were breaks in between them that signified skips in time and the way that it was done was just very disorienting, almost like whiplash. It didn't really feel like we got to stay in a scene long enough sometimes. I also found the way that Betty's personal thought process was portrayed to be a little bit odd. This book is also written in first person point of view so we're stuck with Betty and her thoughts all the time and so I think that somewhat hinders the ability that the book could have to get deeper into this. 
even though it chooses to focus on the more human side of things, we don't know a great deal about the other characters and what they are thinking, simply because we're stuck with Betty all the time. I wasn't a super huge fan of first-person point of view in this case, but I do see why it was done. Next, we have The Black Swan of Paris by Karen Robards, and this book was actually recommended to me by someone in the comment section somewhere. I don't remember what video that was on, but I usually don't take unsolicited book recommendations just because I have lots of books that I already want to read and I don't have a lot of time, but the premise of this one interested me and so I decided to give it a try. This book takes place in the 1940s during World War II. The Nazis have invaded Paris and are currently occupying it, and the main character, Genevieve, is a singer. She's like a darling to the Nazis because she performs and entertains them and they love to hear her sing, but unbeknownst to them she's actually working with the resistance with a man named Max who she met and that's how she became involved with the whole spy network and the resistance. And she was reluctantly recruited into this and she's very resentful of that at the beginning. Does not appreciate being put in such danger because even though she's very popular and she enjoys protections that ordinary citizens do not enjoy, if the Nazis were to find out that she was working with the resistance, they would spare her no mercy. So she doesn't appreciate the dangers that she's being put in. However, her mother is also part of the resistance and after a mission goes horrifically wrong, her mother is captured by the Nazis. And this is very important because her mother has vital information pertaining to the Allied invasion that came to be known as D-Day. And the Nazis cannot obtain this information if the invasion is to succeed. So it is vital that Genevieve's mother either be rescued or silenced before she can give away this very important information. And so now Genevieve has a personal stake in all of this and she is very much determined to rescue her mother because she does not want her mother to be killed either by the Nazis, obviously, or by the resistance itself if they feel like she needs to be silenced if it's not possible to rescue her. So Genevieve wants to rescue her mother. There were times at the beginning, especially, where this book didn't feel very realistic to me, but I can't really speak to that because I'm not an expert on it. It was just a feeling that I got. I have read World War II historical fiction books before where it just felt slightly unrealistic to me. It was more just a feeling that I got. I can't really explain why, but that's just kind of the vibe I got with this book in certain parts. I did see some reviews of this book mention that readers found Genevieve's character to be annoying because of how she complained all the time and how resentful she was of being tricked into resistance work and all of the danger that she's involved with and all of that. And I do agree at the beginning her character is a bit annoying. She seems spoiled and ungrateful and yes she does very much resent being placed in her position, basically coerced into becoming a part of the resistance when she really would prefer not to. And she is kind of whiny and she basically has the attitude, I didn't ask for this, but the entirety of France didn't ask to be invaded by the Nazis either. Like, nobody who's fighting the Nazis right now asked for any of this to happen. So in that regard, she was a little bit unsympathetic, but I did think that when things turned serious and when she learned that her mother was in danger and what had happened to her, and when she chose to get involved to rescue her mother, then I felt like Genevieve's character kind of came into her own. She rose to the occasion and she did what needed to be done. But it was a bit difficult to get through the beginning part where she complained a little bit more than maybe necessary. Although, on the other hand, I do understand her point of view as well. This is a very difficult time for everybody, and I don't think I would appreciate having been brought into the resistance in the manner in which she was, and I certainly wouldn't appreciate having to put my life on the line as frequently as she does. Like, this is a very stressful time. Everybody is under a lot of pressure, and so I can completely also understand where Genevieve is coming from. There is a point in this book where the romance takes over a little bit. There's a blossoming romance between Genevieve and Max in which she realizes how much she cares for him and romance ensues. I'm not exactly sold on it. I'm not convinced by the romantic element in this book. It's basically like a historical fiction slash spy thriller slash romance, but it was published by an imprint of Harlequin, so I'm not entirely surprised. One of the best books I read this year, funnily enough, also a World War II historical fiction, was also printed by a Harlequin imprint. So I know they can be good, but I've also had horrible experiences with Harlequin imprint books. Ironically, again, World War II historical fiction. And the only other thing I have to say about this book is that one of the deaths that occurs feels unnecessary to me. It happens quite suddenly and I understand that that is in fact the way death works sometimes, especially in war, but I didn't feel like it was really necessary to have it happen or to have it happen in the way that it did. I just felt like the characters had already gone through so much at that point together that it didn't seem necessary to kill them off, but again, there is some realism to that because sometimes that's just how it happens, especially given the circumstances that they were in. 
they could be killed at any moment. Next we have The Undertaker's Assistant by Amanda Scanandor, and I had previously read two books by Amanda Scanandor, The Second Life of Muriel West and The Nurse's Secret, and I liked them well enough to try this book out. This book is one of her earlier books, so it came out before the two that I had read, and I didn't end up liking it as much as I did the newer ones. But the premise sounded interesting, and so that's why I picked it up. This book follows Effie, who is a freed woman in the South following the Civil War. She grew up a slave, and she was able to escape and then during the war she was taken in by a Union army surgeon and so that is where she learned about anatomy. She learned the skills that she later brings to her undertaking business in which she becomes an assistant to an undertaker in the south after she moves there following the end of the war. Effie clearly has a traumatic past and memories that she buries and she doesn't really want to think about it. She can't remember anything about her past beyond a certain age, like her first memory that she can recall is the age of seven, and she's running through the woods trying to find the Union soldiers. And so it's very clear that whatever happened to her before this is not a pleasant thing, and she's repressed it, and so she's trying to remember what her life was like before that, who she is, who she knew, and where those people are now. And so this book kind of follows her journey as she learns more about herself and her life and the people that she knew that are now gone and she wants to find out what happened to them. She's doing all of that as she's working as an undertaker's assistant. She also meets a well-off young woman who has fallen on hard times and she's helping her. And then she meets Samson who is a very good public speaker and he's involved in politics and so he wants to recruit Effie and get her involved and so she becomes a member of this Republican club and they're trying to gain public office and campaign for better rights, just civil rights, for fellow African Americans and it's very difficult because they face opposition from the KKK and the white leaguers and they're in the south and it's it's as hard as you can imagine. So from the premise of dealing with an undertaker's assistant, it seems like this would be the perfect opportunity for a murder mystery to be inserted here, like it kind of sort of was with her previous book, The Nurse's Secret, but that's not the case. There's no mystery here. And so the book felt quite slow at times. It felt quite boring. There was really no conflict, nothing that really kept it going very quickly. But the thing that was the hardest for me with this book was Effie's insta-love. The moment she lays eyes on Samson, publicly speaking, she basically falls in love with him and she becomes obsessed with him and there's really no reason for that because they don't even really know each other. It was just very weird. It was very much insta-love. And there were certain points in the book that almost made me think that Effie might have OCD. I am not an expert on this but that was just a vibe that I got. But the author never addressed this and never confirmed it in any way, so I don't know if Effie has a mental health condition or not because it's never explain. Nothing's ever done with any of that. I do kind of like that this book illustrates the dangers of falling for someone who is clearly not any good for you, even though they may be attractive. Spoiler alert here, if you don't want to hear this part, skip ahead to the next book, but Effie does fall for Samson and he ultimately breaks her heart and betrays her. He's exciting and alluring, but at the end of the day, it's Tom that Effie ultimately ends up with. This is never explicitly stated, but it's very much implied at the end of the book. And Tom was the character who was the steady Eddie. He's always there. He's always watching out for Effie. He's reliable. Maybe he's a bit boring compared to Samson, but he is who she ends up with at the end of the day because that's who's good for her. Samson is dangerous and not good for you despite how exciting he might be. Tom is the kind of person who's going to be able to sustain a meaningful long-term relationship unlike someone who's just something shiny and new and here today and gone tomorrow. Another thing, also a spoiler, that I found unrealistic is how fast and easy Effie forgives her friend who betrays her with Samson. Samson being something of a player, he skips from Effie to her friend and her friend ends up becoming pregnant and so the two of them have to get married and at the end of it all, Samson ends up dead, killed in an ambush at a public barbecue event. They were killed by basically white leaguers who came and just massacred everybody that they could at this barbecue. And it's just kind of really sad and it makes you wonder when you're reading it what the point of it all is. But I would not forgive someone as easily as Effie forgave her friend considering what she did to her. She knew how much Samson meant to Effie because Effie confided in her friend. That's what friends are for. And yet she just couldn't resist Samson's charms. The explanation she gives to Effie is completely ridiculous in my opinion. She basically tells Effie that Effie hyped up her feelings for Samson so much so that her friend wanted to experience it for herself. She wanted to know what that kind of love was like and she just couldn't resist Samson because he was in fact everything that 
Effie hyped him up to be. And then obviously another thing that deserves mention with this book is that the racism that is on display is obviously hard to read. It's very realistic because that's how things were. And even though the African Americans were freed after the end of the Civil War, they're no longer slaves, they find themselves blocked at every turn. Especially in the South, we all know that racism was quite prevalent down there and everybody who held racist beliefs and ascribed to those sort of notions tried to keep them from advancement at every turn. They clung desperately to a dying way of life and refused to relinquish power. There's some pretty interesting political issues on display in this book that are explored, but the racism is hard to read through obviously as it should be. Next we have Paperback Jack by Lauren D. Estelman. This is a book about an author named Jacob who is someone who writes for pulp magazines and he goes off to fight in World War II and when he comes back he realizes that the day of the pulp magazines is over, paperbacks are in now. Under the guidance of a new up-and-coming publisher who specializes in these kinds of stories, Jacob becomes Jack and he writes crime books, but he wants his books to be realistic. And in order to achieve that ring of authenticity that he seeks, he finds himself involved with some unsavory characters. And as if that weren't difficult enough, he's trying to balance family life with a woman that he met and fell in love with. And then Congress gets involved because they're pretty upset about the kind of material that is being published in these cheap paperbacks and who can access them, namely minors. And they believe that these books are contributing to the delinquency of minors and, you know, ruining the morals of the nation and that the covers are basically pornography. And with the crime that is portrayed in these books, it's basically just tempting young people to behave badly. And so Congress calls a hearing and various people are summoned to testify and Jack finds himself one of those people. This is a very interesting book to read. It's very outside of my usual comfort zone, what I would usually read. Some of the characters in this book are quite vulgar when they talk, but it did feel realistic and it did feel like it gave the character character, even though I'm personally not a fan. And if you're not a fan of that either, be aware that it comes up quite a lot in this book. But I did learn a lot from it. I didn't know that there was this big boom in these cheap paperbacks at the time and I certainly didn't know that Congress thought that it was such a problem that they had to get involved in such a way. And I looked it up and yeah it was a real thing and yes some of these covers were pornographic. Those accusations were accurate and when I heard that at first I was like this is the 1940s early 50s. Surely it wasn't that bad. Surely if these covers were as pornographic as Congress seems to think they are then they wouldn't be so prevalent. They wouldn't be allowed. I mean, there's just this vibe that that sort of thing didn't happen and not in public. Nowadays, we have stuff everywhere in our faces. It's hard to get away from it. But back then, it just seemed odd because you couldn't even show a woman's midriff on TV. And, you know, in like I Love Lucy, like, even though they were married, Lucy and her husband couldn't sleep in the same bed. Like, I don't know. It was a weird time. But yes, I looked up some of these covers from the original real novels and they were quite explicit so I can see why this created an uproar eventually. However, all of that being said, despite the fact that this book was somewhat entertaining, I also didn't really understand some of it. Some of the characters use terms that I am not familiar with and the writing style is very hard-boiled. It's got that hard-boiled detective kind of vibe to it. But at the end of the day, I'm not sure why this book was written. I don't know what the point of it is. It felt kind of like a non-fiction book in so far as it gave me so much information that I wasn't previously aware of, but it's not a nonfiction book. And the ending was just really weird to me. So I'm not exactly sure what the point of this book was. It was an interesting experience to read it. And it was very short, although it didn't feel as short as it seemed when I was reading it. But all in all, I'm not sure why this book was written. Next up, we have Defy the Night by Bridget Kammerer or Kammerer. I'm, I don't know. This is a YA fantasy that follows a main character named Tessa. She is a person who lives out in the wilds, which is outside of the royal sector, and the people there are suffering more than most because the kingdom has been plagued by these fevers that are fatal, and the only thing that can cure them is the moonflower plant, and it's obviously in short supply. There's not enough of it to go around. It's rationed very heavily, and there's just not enough to go to everyone. And specifically, the people in the poorer sections, such as the wilds, suffer more than most because they don't have the money to afford more of the cure like the people in the royal sector do. So Tessa, along with her best friend Wes, sneak into the royal sector and steal moonflower petals and bring them back to the poorer sectors and distribute them to the needy. 
But one day Wes is caught and he does not come back and Tessa goes looking for him and she finds his body hung outside the city gates and this just breaks her. And in her grief and confusion and just anger at the kingdom as a whole, she sneaks into the palace and obviously this is not a well thought out plan because she ends up being trapped there and discovered and brought to Prince Korik, who is the most feared and hated man in all the kingdom because he is the king's justice. He is the big bad, the executioner. He carries out all the dirty work that his brother, the king, does not want to. He doesn't want to get his hands dirty so he hands it all off to Korik. And so Tessa is very frightened. She's almost certain she's going to join Wes hanging by the city gates until she finds out that Wes isn't dead. Wes never existed. Wes is Prince Korik. So I will say that this was quite a good book for YA fantasy and I did like it much more than a lot of YA books that I read but it did end up ultimately falling flat for me. I still didn't like it. I liked it very much at the beginning until I learned that Wes was actually Prince Korik. What I wanted to happen was for Wes actually to be dead, sad as that is, and for Tessa to become just enraged at the kingdom and to join this growing rebellion and to burn it all down. I was fully prepared for that. I thought that's the book that I was going to get. Not quite. Because as Tessa begins to rethink everything she thinks she knows about Prince Korik, whom she personally hated before she realized that this was actually the man that she's been working with this whole time, who's been helping her distribute medicine to the sick and the dying, that doesn't exactly fit with everything she knows about Prince Korik. And she learns that Korik actually really hates his job as King's Justice. He hates getting his hands dirty. He hates doing all this cruel stuff, but he does it in order to spare his brother Harriston, who is, in his mind, the softer of the two of them. He only ever wants to protect his brother and keep him safe and so he does these jobs so that his brother doesn't have to do them. But he very much doesn't like the role, he doesn't like being cruel, and these acts that he has to sometimes do tear him apart on the inside. And so as Tessa begins to rethink everything she thinks she knows about the kingdom and Korik, she begins to become more sympathetic to the kingdom's struggle and their plight because they don't have any way to ensure that everybody gets medicine either. So what are they supposed to do? However, the tensions within the kingdom are rising, there is calls for revolution, Harriston and Korik's reign is challenged at every turn, and Tessa sympathizes with the sides of both. She understands why people are rebelling and why they're rising up, but she also understands the impossible position that Harriston and Korik are in, and so she finds herself caught between the two of them and she doesn't really know what to do. The reason that I didn't ultimately like this book and why I have decided not to read the sequel is that this book is just a bit tropey. Personally, I'm very tired of reading about YA male characters who are portrayed as being the big bad. They are cruel, they are horrible, they do all these terrible things. But on the inside, they're a precious cinnamon roll and they really don't want to do these things. And doing these things is tearing them apart inside. That's fine insofar as it goes. I understand why it's portrayed that way. It's portrayed that way because Korik is not ultimately a terrible person and he needs to be redeemable and we need to come to care about him. We need to come to like him as a character. And if he truly is that terrible and he's doing these horrible things, then that's not going to happen and we're not going to like him. And so I understand why it is done the way it is. But I also feel like you can't have it both ways. Either this person is a cinnamon roll on the inside and doing these things really would break them, or they really are this horrible, cruel person and this is who they are. I feel like if you are a cinnamon roll on the inside and these things would break you, then eventually you would just be broken and you would become that person who is just that cruel, who is basically a nerd to the suffering and you're numb to it and it doesn't affect you anymore. But again, we can't have that because Korok needs to be a completely redeemable person. And I'm not saying that people who have done horrible things are not redeemable. I'm not saying that at all. It's just that the way that it's portrayed in YA books this way is something I'm tired of seeing. I would, for once, like to see a YA character who just is the big bad, who just is that bad, but then of course we couldn't have this romance between Tessa and Korik. And that's also why Wes couldn't be a real person and that's why Wes ultimately wasn't dead and Tessa then becomes enraged and uses that to light the fire that inspires her to rise up against the kingdom and burn it all down. That's why we can't have that because then we still don't have this romance between Tessa and Korik and that is typically the whole point in YA, it seems like. That's the whole point. Everything else is just put in there to bring the two protagonists together, but ultimately the plot is their romance. I'm not convinced that that's entirely the point here, but I do feel like the romance hinders the story more than lifts it up. In the end, it wasn't the story that I had thought and hoped it would be, and it was just too tropey for my personal tastes. Next up, we have Kaikei by Vaishnavi Patel. I'm probably like butchering all of that, and I'm sorry. This is a feminist interpretation of the Ramayana myth 
slash epic that is very much a part of Hindu culture. I had never heard of the Ramayana before and I have learned a great deal just by reading this book. Before I get into this book specifically, I will say that some people in reviews I have seen expressed displeasure with this book because they found it offensive to Indian culture and the Hindu religion as a whole. And they felt like Indians who are faithful to the Hindu religion and its culture will find this book disrespectful to that. So I'm just going to lay that out there. They especially took issue with the way that Rama was portrayed, which we'll get into a little bit more. Personally, I don't have an issue with this book. I loved it, actually. But I do want to throw that out there. They said that this book was basically written for a Western audience who has no knowledge or interest in Indian culture or Hinduism, and I can definitely see why that would be the case. But that being said, I just wanted you to be aware of that. Even so, I quite enjoyed this book. So as I said, this book is a feminist interpretation of the Ramayana myth. Focusing on Kaikeyi, it makes her the main character. This book is told in a first-person point of view, but I actually didn't mind that. I thought it was well done, and it definitely makes Kaikeyi's character deeper and humanizes her in a way that the original myth probably didn't. Since I've not read the original myth, I can't speak to it, but from what I do sort of know, Kaikeyi was presented in the original myth as a bad person. She wasn't like a villain per se, because that title goes to someone else in the myth, but she definitely was not viewed as a positive person. So this is Kaikeyi's story told from the moment she was born. She was a twin to her brother, whose name I probably cannot pronounce. She was born first, but because he was the son, he was made the heir instead of her, and she had six other brothers, seven total. And so as a girl, her only real worth was to be married off and secure some sort of alliance for her kingdom. And that's exactly what happens. Kaikeyi is married off to a neighboring very powerful kingdom. She's married to a king, a raja named Dasharath, who is luckily for her and very happily a good man. He treats her very well. He had two other wives prior to her, Sumitra and Kushalya, and he was not able to have an heir from either of them, and so that's why he married Kaikeyi in the hopes that she could give him a son. Various things ensue, and it turns out that all three women end up having sons. Krishalya gives birth to Rama, Kaikeyi gives birth to a son named Bharata, and Sumitra has twins, Lakshmana and... I honestly just blanked. I can't remember the other one's name, but he's not, he's not as prominent a character in this book, so apologies. Anyway, the whole point of this story, the central problem, if you will, is that Rama is a god in human form. In Hinduism, he's actually one of the avatars of Vishnu. It never really gets into that in the book, and I am not familiar with Hinduism, but Rama is a god in human form. He has come here to rid the mortal world of evil. Kaikeyi has faced opposition her entire life. Women are looked down upon, they're obviously viewed as lesser, they cannot hold as many positions as men, and they're very limited as to what they are allowed to do with their life. And so Kaikeyi has used her position as queen to Raja Dasharath to advocate for women and try to make their lives better. And Dasharath being the man that he is, he values her opinion, he promotes her within his court, and she attains the power that she wants and she vows to teach her sons to respect women. But something goes wrong. Under the influence of a sage or holy man in this world, Rama adopts some pretty problematic views about women, and Kaikeyi tries to influence him for the better, but ultimately he won't be swayed. He tries to persuade her that he is in the right and he wants her to support him, but he is a god and he's here on this very important mission and Kaikeyi and all these other mortals just won't understand his mission. They can't possibly, and so the sage, being a holy man, tried to help Rama in his quest, and so that's why Rama values that man's opinion so much, because he's the only one being a sort of priest, if you will, who can somewhat understand what Rama's going through with his duality between divinity and being an ordinary man. In the original myth, the Ramayana, it's very much Rama's story, and this is a bit of a spoiler. Uh, Kaikeyi ends up banishing, exiling Rama to the forest. In the book, she does this because she feels it's the best thing for the kingdom. He's about to take the throne, Dasharath has agreed to step down, and Rama's going to take the throne, but when she married Dasharath, he promised Kaikeyi that her son would become Raja, even if he wasn't born first, and even though she is his third wife, he agreed to that. And Kaikeyi's brother, who is now the ruler of the kingdom that she grew up in and was born in, 
feels that this is a personal slight, that Dasharath has broken his oath and that Rama is going to take the throne. And he tells Kai Kei that unless she convinces Dasharath to put Bharata on the throne, his kingdom is going to declare war against hers. Kai Kei is desperate to avoid this because she knows firsthand how devastating war is, and so she exiles Rama to the forest for 10 years in the hopes that he will think about the things that he says and the views that he has and become a better person, and also in those 10 years hopefully he will mature enough to where he will be ready to take the throne when the time comes. Unfortunately, this obviously has a huge backlash. People hated Kai Kei. She lost all the favor that she had in the court and the respect she had within the kingdom. She is seen as a jealous woman because her son wasn't going to be on the throne. Basically, they think a lot of bad things about her and they say a lot of bad things about her as well. And that is why she is a reviled person in the original myth. She banished the God King. I don't think in the myth it really goes into any deep reasons as to why she does this. I believe I read her jealous wicked servant convinces her to do this rather than it be her own decision but in the book it's very much a difficult decision for Kakei to make but she does it because she feels she has no choice. She's doing it because it's the best thing for the kingdom even though it destroys the relationships that she has with everybody else. This is a very emotionally wrenching thing to have read at the end of the book. I felt bad for Kaikei. I understood her motivations completely. It just was an emotional gut punch. Another thing about this book that was interesting was the magic that Kaikei discovers. She always prayed to the gods as a child and they never answered and so she ended up finding a magic that she can use herself and it was called the binding plane and it allows her to see a physical representation in the form of strings that represent the bonds that she has with others, the relationships that they share, and through this she can manipulate those relationships. I thought at first when it was first introduced to us it was going to be used in a naive innocent way because she was still a child and then over time we would see it become used in a more narcissistic controlling manipulative way and then Kai Kei would sort of complete her transition at, to the villain character but that never happens because Kai Kei isn't the villain even though she's sort of made out to be one in the original myth. What I liked about this is that it deepened the characters, it deepened their motivations from just the baseline explanation that we seem to be given in the myth Again, I cannot speak to that because I am not an expert, but I liked it. I liked the way it fleshed out the world. I liked the way it humanized all the characters, and you become invested in Kai Kei and her story and her successes, and then you feel for her when all of that is taken away. And it was a horrible decision that she had to make, but it was, in this book at least, presented as the right one. I didn't think that the feminism overtones were annoying. I know that that can sometimes be a thing we have to watch out for, depending on how it's portrayed and if it's shoved down your throat or not, but I didn't think that it was. I thought it was portrayed very well and very accurately, because we do know that throughout history most cultures and kingdoms were very patriarchal and misogynistic and women didn't have a lot of rights and they were considered second-class citizens and so the struggles that Kai Kei points out and fights against in her attempt to advocate for other women who may not be as privileged as she is as queen, it felt realistic to me. It felt like something that would have happened, something that needed to happen, and I didn't find a problem with it. I very much loved it, but I do understand why people who are knowledgeable about the original myth and whose culture this is from, I can see why they would be not a fan of this story, but for my part, I very much enjoyed it. And last but not least, the final book on this list is Can't Catch My Breath by Sarah Sutton. I got this book for Christmas and I just finished reading it. This is a YA romance and these books are the reason why I cannot say that I hate romance because I don't hate all of them. I love these books. This particular book follows Addie who is grieving the loss of her dad who died in a car accident and in psychology class she is paired with another student. They're supposed to interview each other for an assignment and get to know each other better. Unfortunately for her that student that she is paired with is Vincent whose dad was also involved in the same car accident and left paralyzed and so it's very awkward between the two of them and they have to try to navigate this and it goes from just wanting to get this assignment done to actually getting to know the other person and realizing that the assumptions that they had about the other person were wrong. And of course, this being a YA romance, obviously romance is involved, romance blossoms between the two characters. I just love these books. All of the books I've read so far by Sarah Sutton have been well thought out and fleshed out. It goes beyond simply a romance. These books are deeper than just that and they have something to say. And this book in particular hit me in the feels because of the subject matter. It was quite sad at times. It portrays grief and deals with all of the struggles around that and I thought that it was quite realistically done 
and it was just well done as a whole and it, you know hit you in the feels and I just really loved that. I loved Vincent's character. He's different than a lot of guys that you see in romance and he's different from the other two that I've been introduced to so far in the other books by Sarah Sutton that I've read so I appreciated that he was different. I feel like he has that broodiness down that so many guys seem to want to have in YA but just don't. It falls flat but not with him. I felt that he was just interesting and different. He's got that broodiness, that mysteriousness, that aloofness and just you know there's more to him under the surface but it's going to take a little bit to get him to open up and it just works so well with the whole premise of those two having to interview each other for the class assignment and overall I just thought it was super well done. I loved it. It was very emotional and it's deeper than simply a romance which I don't find that often but I very much enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to reading the next one. So there you have it. This video is probably super long, but those are all of the books I read for the month of December. I'm very happy to have finally gotten back to more of a reading schedule outcome, if you will, that I used to have. And I look forward to getting a lot more books read in 2023. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed, feel free to leave a like, comment, and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I will see you in the next video. Bye!